Welcome to Cyber Salon. Uh, Ava was kind enough to ask me to chair this meeting, so uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event that's been happening for a very long time, and Ava will talk a little bit about it later on. But today we're here with the theme of reclaiming the net. So a question to ask, or a question that comes to mind is, what or who are we reclaiming the net from? So I thought, well, we're trying to reclaim it from Silicon Valley to start with. We're trying to reclaim it from Mark Zuckerberg and Eric Schmidt. Um, we're trying to reclaim it from Facebook and Twitter and Google and all of these various companies who have the same business model, the same business. Uh, and it's a model that we're familiar with, actually. In the era of personal computing, we had a very clear, very unambiguous name for software that you installed on your computer that surreptitiously, without your knowledge, did other things, like steal your information and maybe you know, send it to other people. Um, we used to call that spyware, right? Very unambiguous, and it was very easy to recognize spyware 1.0 because it was really cloak and dagger, wasn't it? Um, you thought that an app would do one thing, but then it did something else, and it stole your data. Um, the problem is spyware 2.0 is not as easy to recognize because spyware 2.0 is all about cute little privacy dinosaurs like they have on Facebook and doodles on Google and uh, all colors of the rainbow. Spyware 2.0 loves you like a kitten and sends you kittens. Um, but it also does something a bit more insidious. Um, it redefines what private means. Now private used to have a very set meaning, right? Um, if we were having a private conversation, for example, we knew that we would be, you know, two people, and I'd say something to you, and you'd say something back, and we'd know that it was taking place just between us. That was private, right? Um, let's take a look at what Facebook says, or, or means, when they say private. So we might think, who's had a private conversation on Facebook here? Yeah? Yeah, where you go, go into uh, a private one-on-one -on -one conversation. Who's had a private conversation on Facebook that they wouldn't want on this screen right now to be recreated? Anyone? Couple? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. So you might think when you're having a private chat on Facebook that it's the same thing. You're saying something to your friend, your friend's replying, it's just between you two, right? But you'd be mistaken. For one thing, you're not in a public space like a park. Facebook is a private space, like a mall. So really, you're in their home. And whose home are you in? Well, you're in the home of a creepy uncle. <laughs> and that creepy uncle is involved in your conversation. So when Facebook talks about private, what, what, what's actually happening is you tell Facebook what you, want to, what you want Facebook to relay to me. Facebook takes note of that and then relays the message to me. But of course, saves it and takes note of it and starts analyzing it, right? So when Facebook says private, what they really mean is public. So George Orwell had a great term for this in the book 1984. He called it double-think. So in order to understand what Facebook means when Facebook says private or when Google says private, we have to engage in double-think. We have to actually understand that it's public. It's not private because there's someone in the middle who is also a party to this conversation. Who else do we have to reclaim it from? Well, we have to reclaim the net from governments, right? But governments would not have as easy a time in surveilling all of us and carrying out dragnet surveillance if it wasn't for the corporations. Why? Because it's so much easier for a government to ask an entity like Facebook for information that you have voluntarily 
given to them because it's not under the same legal protections. It's much easier also because it's in one place. They only have to knock on one door. And what that means is that it's cheap. It's cheap to spy on everyone. It's pennies on the person. If we can raise that to pounds, to 100 pounds, to 1,000 pounds per person, then it's going to become economically infeasible for them to spy on everyone. And then they can pick and choose their targets. Now, you might want to have a different conversation about whether we should have spy agencies, but if we have spy agencies, they're going to spy on people. It's kind of what they do. Uh, less people would probably have a problem with them actually picking one or two targets to spy on. And then who else can we reclaim it from? Well, we can reclaim it from startups. Startups. Aren't startups great? I don't think so. Uh, here's a startup called Spritz. Who's heard of Spritz? Spritz is revolutionary, isn't it? This is how it works. Um, it's a new way of tweeting. Try it as it's going on. Try it. It's pretty cool, right? It's probably the first new way of reading since reading. <laughs> so, pretty big news. Um, the CEO of Spritz was speaking at the same event that I was speaking at, at Thinking Digital, this year. And he said, you know, Spritz is, is awesome. We have feedback from people um, who have dyslexia that, you know, they can read much faster with Spritz. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So what's your business model? Um, and then he said, well, we have a free software development kit, a free SDK that we give to developers, and we want them to embed our Spritz components in all of their applications. So yeah, that's really great. What's your business model? Oh, we know what you're reading. <laughs> that's our business model. We monetize that data, right? So, uh, and then he went on to say that he really wanted to see more people building email applications uh, with their software development. <laughs> um, but there's something a bit darker here. Remember the bit about dyslexia that he said, entirely unscientifically, it's not backed up by any research, but he said that they had reports that people with dyslexia read better with this, right? What does that actually mean? What are they actually telling people? What are they telling people with dyslexia? They're saying, either use our beautiful new way of reading, but let us spy on you and read better, or don't use it and read worse. I really think humanity deserves better than this, right? We can do better than this myopic business model, this one very specifically myopic and toxic business model that we've gone from Silicon Valley that we're all trying to emulate now. Look at London. Look at, the, uh, look at how much investment Google is making in startups and accelerators and, right, to, to, to perpetuate this one business model that they rely on. And maybe we can reclaim it from the Internet of Things as well. You might be thinking, what the hell? The Internet of Things is good, right? It's positive. It's great. It's going to be everywhere. It's awesome. Um, no, I beg to differ. So Nest. Nest is a great, great example of this. Uh, so Nest is the thermometer that, you know, uh, home control unit that knows when you're home, knows when you're not at home, right? Have you been following Nest? Because at the beginning of this year, they got bought by Google. This is a device that knows when you're home, when you're not home, etc. Right? They got bought by Google, and then immediately they said, hey, we won't share any customer data with Google, don't worry about it. They gave us all those billions because they really love our logo. <laughs> and uh, they don't want any of that data. <sighs> How do they make money? They monetize data, but they don't want to touch that, right? That's like you're on a diet. And, and there's this amazing chocolate cake, like, you know, in the fridge, and you're going, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> you're going to so fucking touch that. <laughs> you really are. So in June, Nest, now Google Nest, stay with me, it gets a bit confusing. Right? Google Nest bought Dropcam, a camera that you put in your home that you know, can watch your home. Right? But then it was okay because they said, welcome to the family, Dropcam, and don't worry because like Nest customer data, Dropcam will come under Nest's, Google Nest's privacy policy, which means that we won't share data with Google. Now, that was in, on, on June 20th of this year. If you were following the press, on June 24th, <laughs> Nest to share user information with Google. 
for the first time. And what were the rest of us doing? Well, I think we were kind of going, hey, the water is really getting warm. Is it, isn't this comfortable? This is like, we've, we've never had a summer like this. It's really great. Um, so what's the problem here? The problem is that without individuals having ownership and control, the Internet of Things becomes the Internet of Things that spy on you. Without individuals, us, human beings, having ownership and control over our technology and our data, wearables, the quantified self, becomes the surveilled self. So these are also things we need to reclaim. But we also have to be quite careful about how we go about trying to reclaim them. Who's heard of Elo? <laughs> right. Has anyone read my uh, post? It's kind of gone viral a bit. It's a bit scary. I was talking to Norwegian television this morning at 8 a.m. trying to be coherent, um, thinking it was Dutch television. That didn't help. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, hello. Right? Um, I spoke with Paul back in May. And he, he approached me and said, we love your manifesto. And I'm talking about the Indie manifesto. So when he said, we love your manifesto, I thought, wow, you love the fact that we reject venture capital. You love the fact that we say that products that are alternatives have to be free as in freedom. And you must love the fact that um, we want to create a new distributed topology, not a centralized one. Um, but if you look at a low, it's closed. I tried to give them advice on that. I was like, please open up your source code, you know, so that you don't, so that people don't have to trust you. If someone has to trust you, you don't deserve trust. So it was closed. But I, I thought, okay, you know, maybe they're not confident. They're just starting out. They're a small group of people. They're not confident in their code. They're not all programmers. It was centralized. Another smell. Right? Why is it centralized? A centralized solution is not going to fix the privacy issue when all the data is in one place. But what I didn't know at the time, because I never thought to ask, because they said we love your manifesto, was that they'd actually taken venture capital as well. Not a lot, about $500,000, but enough. Enough that when that runs out, they're going to have to go for a Series A. And then they're deeper. They're entrenched in this. So that changed my opinion of a love somewhat. <laughs> Especially because creating an actual alternative, an independent alternative, is not something that is a mystery. Right? We do have that manifesto. And yesterday, we started talking about Project Stratosphere, where we're doing just that. But compare. Compare Elo to what we're doing. Right? It's independent. Not only did we not take venture capital, we will not take venture capital. It is against everything that we stand for. You take venture capital, you've already sold your users before you built the thing that you're building. It's called an exit. Venture capitalists do not invest in a business. They invest in their exit. That's all you need to know to understand venture capital. And if you look at the world we've created, it's a world that runs on venture capital. What kind of a myopic system is this? So no, of course we don't take venture capital. We're bootstrapped. I sold a home that my family has been paying into for 30 years or so, a cooperative. Um, we got to see it once in the summer, and we decided that what we're doing is more important than having a house in Ankara, my family are Turkish. And that's how we're, we're, we're supporting it right now. We're going to go to crowdfunding in November. And we're going to have revenue streams going forward, not least of which will be the phone at the end of this. The products that we're making, the core network that we're making, is free as in freedom, not open. Open is a meaningless word. It's become a meaningless word. Open, as in open source, grew out of a reaction to free software. Free software, the Richard Stallman movement from 30 years ago, was about freedom, freedom for society. It wasn't a technological movement, necessarily. Open source said, wow, look, there are productivity enhancements to having the source be open. There are efficiency enhancements to this. But there's also morality and ethics attached to this, and businesses don't like that. What if we could just split the two? What if we could just make it about the source being open, because that is good for business? That's what open source is. Open source is good for business. Free, as in freedom, is good for human beings and society. That's what we're interested in. 
So everything we release will be released under a free, as in freedom, license. The network that we're building, the network we have to build, has to be distributed. Not centralized. Centralized is what we have today, the monopolies that we have today. <coughs> Not decentralized. You keep hearing decentralized as the answer. Decentralized simply means that there are many centers. It does not mean that there are no centers. Because of economies of scale, those centers will coalesce until you get a very centralized system like the one that we have today. The web is not broken. You keep hearing that, right? The web is broken. We broke the, the web. No. The web has evolved into what it was designed from the start. It was a client and server system. It was decentralized. There were economies of scale for certain nodes, Facebook, Google, etc., so that they grew, and now we have the monopoly that we have. If we're going to build an alternative, it has to be distributed, where every node is equally weighted, where you are the network, where we are the network, where if three of us are talking, then that is the network. There is no center. This is the only way to solve this problem. It's the only topology that cannot then be uh, adapted for other purposes. And, and the stuff that we make has to be design-led. It needs to be beautiful. It needs to be convenient. It needs to be usable. This is where free and open source has failed. Failed dismally in the last 30 years. Free and open source has been a huge success where enthusiasts create things for other enthusiasts. It runs the internet, right? Free software runs the internet. But in the consumer space, there is just crickets. There is no free and open in terms of an end user experience. Why? Because we're not designing for consumers. And we need to start doing that. Because this is a battle that will be fought in the consumer market. Let me put it really bluntly. If the stuff we make isn't as beautiful as the stuff that's out there, and I don't mean aesthetically, I mean in terms of function, isn't it, if it's not as delightful, none of the other stuff matters. It doesn't matter that it's distributed, it doesn't matter that it's free as in freedom. It doesn't matter that it protects your privacy. Nobody's going to use it. And it's going to fail. So that's what the Indie Manifesto stands for. So if you're going to call me up and say, I love your manifesto, understand the freaking manifesto. <laughs> Do not go and build a closed, centralized, venture capital funded system and then say, we love your manifesto, because you apparently do not, or you don't understand it. And if we can build these alternatives, then we can do something quite special. Instead of starting people out in the home of a creepy uncle who pays the rent by spying on them, we can start people out in a safe place, in a place that they, they own themselves, their own <coughs> homes. And if we can do that, then we can create an environment where our digital selves have the same rights as our corporeal selves. There is no difference between these two things. There is no such thing as digital rights. There are only human rights. And if we do that, we can build a future where we enjoy human rights, where we have fundamental freedoms, and where we still have democracy. And I believe that that is worth fighting for, and that's what we're trying to reclaim. So, thank you.